Hi, uh, I'm Kevin McVary. I'm a urologist from SIU, Southern Illinois University in Springfield, Illinois. And uh, thank you for tuning in uh, this afternoon concerning the management of nocturia, which you know, I would say is, is very much an unmet need in lower urinary tract symptoms, otherwise known as LUTs. So there's my disclosures, that's important. So nocturia is a very um, troublesome uh, urination symptom uh, defined by the International Continent Society as getting up at least one time per night to urinate. However, urologists kind of uh, amongst ourselves have felt that uh, really nocturia, the kind that we care about, the level or severity that we care about as clinicians really is probably at least two or more times per night as long as you go try to go back to sleep so as long as there's a follow-up attempt at sleep that's kind of the definition that we work with uh, clinically but there's an important missing component of those those two definitions and that's the sense of bother and that because a lot of symptoms are relative to the amount of bother induced on the patient. If a patient's getting up twice a night um, to urinate, going back to bed, but he feels in the morning that he's refreshed, he's not bothered at all, why are we all getting upset? Whereas another person getting up twice a night might bother him a lot. So that's an important component of measuring nocturia. So we, we look at that sense of bother to the patient as impairing his quality of life, something that we really want to do, uh, improve in patients. The economic burden from getting up in the middle of the night, nocturia, it's substantial. It's not just the sleep deprivation and feeling crummy in the morning. It's injuries from, from falls. The man gets up, tries to get to the washroom, falls, breaks his hip. That's a big deal. Also, productivity loss at work. Because he's getting up at night, he's not, he's not his best uh, at work during the day. And then there are men, there are people that have uh, such significant nocturia that there's loss in their life, like distress, um, behavior changes get induced. They won't travel, they won't vacation, they annoy, they feel they annoy the family members around them, they stay home, and it you know, leads to a lot of confinement. And the financial impact is considerable from this problem. Uh, the indirect costs are estimated at $61 billion a year. It's a lot of money. So who gets it? Well, it's gender neutral, mostly. Um, it's more common in women less than 50 years of age. And then in the 50s, it's pretty equivalent between both men and women. But then as we get above that age into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it's much more common in men. So we've done some studies on this with what we call male lower urinary tract symptoms or IMLUTs, measuring the, what are the symptoms that prompt a patient, to, a man, to go to see a urologist. And the number one complaint is nocturia. And even though urologists may do a lot of different treatments, medications, etc., when we reassess those patients later, about half of them basically have no improvement. And that tells us the significance of the unmet need in trying to treat nocturia. So nocturia is multifactorial. It's not about the prostate. It's probably about getting old, but it's not just about the prostate or the bladder. That it may be a manifestation in the pelvis of a more systemic problem, like a sleep disorder. Now, we know that sleep's critical in a person's overall health and in the quality of their life. I mean, just walk around and ask friends at work about how was your, last, your, your night last night. They'll comment about how well they slept. I mean, it's important. And we know that sleep is critical because it's associated with mortality. If, if people have less sleep, the mortality rates increase. Now, you have to be careful about causation there, but, you know, it's... Um, it's kind of a critical aspect of our health and an underestimated one too. There's a greater risk of metabolic syndrome. That's the, the obesity, pre-diabetic, global systemic uh, disease. And then as I already mentioned, we know that 
nighttime falls and fractures are higher in people that have sleep disorders and have to get up in the middle of the night to, uh, to urinate. We know that if you get up in the middle of the night to urinate, it interferes with your sleep efficiency. It prolongs what we call sleep latency, the amount of time before you can get back to sleep. You know, you don't get up, urinate, go back to bed. You toss and turn a while, and then finally you do. That's, that's the latency. And again, we know that this is associated with increased mortality. So how, what types of sleep issues should a urologist really be thinking about, or at least wondering about, if a patient comes to him complaining about sleep, of a nocturial problem? And one of them is kind of standard sleep apnea. You know, asking the patient, do you snore? Does your partner complain about you snoring? Uh, do you have trouble getting to sleep, insomnia? Do you have these, what's known as parasomnias, you know, these nighttime behaviors, you know, sleepwalking and um, kind of a physical activity while you're supposedly asleep. And then, of course, kind of the classic restless sleep, a restless leg syndrome, which is, again, one of these sleep disorders, um, which can be exacerbated by nocturia. As a clinician, how do you approach them? Well, I would say, you know, systematically. You want to always do a complete history and physical. That's pretty standard. And then you want to pay attention to cues in the medical history, which may tip you off that, is this a pelvis, prostate, bladder problem, or is this a more global issue with this patient? So things like hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, these are kind of the hallmarks of the metabolic syndrome I mentioned before. That would be important things to draw out in your history. Coronary artery disease, um, you know, pretty significant association with lower urinary tract symptoms, but also with nocturia itself. And then underlying kidney disease, you know, if a man has a lot of proteinuria, glucosuria, um, a lot of issues with his urine production, he will have nocturia. And then I've already mentioned the sleep disorders. And then the big elephant in the room is medications. So that would be iatrogenic nocturia. You know, medications are given to patients that ruin their sleep uh, habits. And this is a real eye, eye opener. I, I suppose for most doctors, they get it. You know, patients take di diuretics, they're going to have an increased diuresis and they're going to get up during the day or night, depending on when they time the medication. But this would be important things to draw out of a patient who may present to you with nocturia. You need to look beyond your own specialty and look to say, well, what else is happening health wise, which may impacting this patient's getting up in the middle of the night and kind of listed them there, you know, diuretics that makes make sense. But a lot of other medications, tetracycline, lithium, SSRIs, pretty common depression and some other disorders, um, all these can impact diuresis. And then there's medications which simply impact the central nervous system and can induce insomnia. And I've listed a lot of them. I'm not going to go over all the details. You can read them. But Basically, it's all the things we, we use as clinicians and as primary care physicians, and even over-the-counter medications may impact patients uh, getting up in the middle of the night. So that would be the time to figure it out right now and then. Other things to approach systematically? Well, first is, I would say, you need to measure not just how many times did you get up at night, but how is it affecting you? How is it bothering you? And if it's not bothering them, then do you, do you need to do it? It's always important to look at the urinalysis. Again, looking for protein, glucose, things which may drive uh, kind of a obligate diuresis and an obligate nocturia. Uh, as urologists, we're always keen to look at post residual. How much is in the bladder when the patient thinks he's empty? Uh, he may not be empty, therefore the kind of water over the dam effect. And then the use of the 24-hour avoiding diary, urination diary, it's, it's very valuable, it's cheap, the patient does it himself, and it's an objective tool that can really categorically define the type of nocturia your patient has. And again, I'd encourage you to consider that. So we have several categories. I think the important ones are global polyuria, where the patient's urine out, output in a full day is just massive. Um, you want to look for causes for that, like Okay, he just drinks a lot of water during the day, or maybe he has diabetes or diabetes insipidus. Um, people who get up, who make more urine at night. This is very common in our elderly population. And there's definitions for this. I won't 
detail all those to you. But essentially, uh, if the giddy, if the volume produced at night is more than a third of his overall urination volume, that's nocturnal polyuria. And how can you impact it? Well, you try to reduce the amount of fluid intake before the patient's sleep. Tell them to cut back after dinner. Uh, patients with congestive heart failure, uh, they, they need to mobilize that fluid and they mobilize it when they're recumbent. Patient has sw ankle swelling, uh, edema in his lower extremities or in the presacral area, then that would tip you off that he's accumulating fluid and that's going to have to be mobilized when he's recumbent. Now the question is, he can mobilize it when he's asleep, or maybe you can do some behavior stuff to have him be recumbent later in the afternoon to start mobilizing some of that food. Put his legs up in a lazy boy in the late afternoon, 45 minutes or so. Start to mobilize that fluid before he gets to night, uh, gets to sleep. Now I've mentioned sleep apnea. I'm not gonna um, go in it again, but again, you want to think about that. Now there could be underlying problems with the bladder that simply reduce bladder capacity. And, you know, some of this is bladder outlet obstruction. We know men with detrusor overactivity have an overactive bladder. They're going to have some issues. And those are things which you can assess here dynamically. Behavior aspects. You know, I, patients drink a lot and they go every 10 minutes by a matter of habit. Okay. People with neurogenic bladder, of course. And things which might irritate the bladder, like carcinoma in situ, bladder stones, etc. And then, of course, you're going to have categories of all of these. They don't have to be um, just unidimensional. How do you go about treatment? Well, my own view is begin conservatively. Look for those behavior cues to see, hey, is there something I can do with this person's behavior uh, to reduce his nocturia and maybe avoid getting real complicated workup or complicated treatment. And then, you know, the issue of medications. Um, what medications is he on, which might be contributing, and what medications could you try to reduce the nocturia? We'll get that. Of course, always tailor that treatment to the to the individual. With one caveat, look for the mechanism. If you can identify the mechanism of action, why the patient's having it, it really makes the choice of tailor tailoring um, treatment a lot easier. So things from the behavior aspect to try and reduce getting up in the middle of the night, decrease bedtime fluid intake. How many patients come to you complaining and they have a glass of water at the bedside? Stop that. Um, alcohol, big impact on getting up at night, as does caffeine. Now, compressive stockings, these are would be really more for the people with peripheral edema, you know, swollen ankles, and if you can mobilize some of that fluid early, uh, they'll have less complaint. And this idea of having the patients lay back later in the afternoon, the late afternoon recumbency mobil helps mobilize this peripheral edema. If the patients have a sleep apnea, CPAP, it's, it's curative. Uh, it's an ongoing treatment, but it can be very effective with this, and I can't emphasize that enough. As urologists, we're probably not the type of physicians that would prescribe or alter a patient's diuretic use that they're using for other reasons. But things to consider would be to take those earlier in the day so that they don't in so that they do not impact nocturia. Um, and some some would advocate taking antidiuretics later in the evening uh, to, so you reduce urine manufacture uh, during the night. A couple of things to be aware of. One the impact of alpha blockers on nocturia is pretty pretty modest, so don't set your hopes too high. Set five ARIs, finasteride, dutasteride, um, you know, they don't have much of an impact on nocturia. It, there's some some impact, but um, it's it's not marked. Anti-muscarinics, anticholinergics, again, uh, something of a marginal effect. And if the only complaint is nocturia, no other voiding complaints, then I would say these might not be the right, the right activity to try. Um, the beta-3 agonist category is just now being explored as an impact. We know it has an act, a, activity on over, uh, bladder overactivity. M its impact on nocturia is probably there, but new information is soon to come. Now, you're probably aware of this low-dose intranasal desmopressin, Noctivia. It's a newer medication. Uh, been on the market for in a few months uh, for the, I would say, uh, 2018 
spring of 2018. Uh, uh, approved earlier in the year, but really now um, kind of access to clinicians, you might want to think about that. Um, think about pregnancy status and be aware of sodium changes. You want to monitor that. And patients with um, sig more significant congestive heart failure, you want to be cautious. I, I would say maybe that's not the place for you to be. Men with uh, men and women with um, taking loop diuretics or have hypertension, which is not controlled, again, might want to be cautious with that. What about surgery? Surgery for nocturia? Well, you know, we know that surgery can improve nocturia in men with bladder neck obstruction from BPH. We know that. Um, and sometimes patients can have an bladder overactivity related to the um, bladder neck obstruction. We know that. Um, so um, that should be proven, not assumed. So I would look at surgery for bladder outlet obstruction for BPH that is worth pursuing, but, but only once you've really done pressure flow studies, uh, voiding diaries, and identified that this nocturia is part and parcel of an obstruction process, not a, a primary nocturnal polyuria or another cause of nocturia, because the patient's going to be disappointed, and you will too. Other things to consider before surgery would be, you know, botulinum toxin. And some patients would have, some doctors would advocate for um, sacral modulation, neural stem type things. So wrapping this up, number one, nocturia, it's an unmet need. It's a problem that, common problem that patients have that a kind of a component of BPH. It's a little bit of an orphan symptom. And we really need to think of this as almost a unique disease. In men with lower urinary tract symptoms, it's the most bothersome component even though uh, there are lots of other components to LUTs from BPH, but this is the, the worst component of it. It's pretty uniform. Uh, there's quite a burden in quality of life from this, so it's not, it's not obtuse. Um, a lot of uh, potential factors influencing, and this obscures the diagnosis, which is why I think we've uh, not done a good job with it uh, from a medicine standpoint. And I would advocate that Nocturia is kind of a pelvic expression of a systemic medical problem. Think about sleep apnea, sleep problems, fluid retention, all the things that we just reviewed. It has a unique symptom complex. It's a special concern, and it really requires the clinician to be judicious in their evaluation. Kevin, thanks for that uh, great comprehensive uh, presentation. You know, this is really, as you said, a neglected problem in our practice, and and we see a lot of a lot of uh, men and women that uh, complain of nocturia. It's nice to have a definition and options, and some of the new treatments are exciting too. You know, I I find it's quite variable. You know, I have men come in to see me, and and I ask them why they're there, and they say, oh, there's nothing wrong. I don't know." And I say, "Well, what brought you in?" And they say, "Well, my wife told me to come in." And I said, "Why did your wife tell you to come in?" Well, I get up six times a night. Bothers her. It doesn't bother me. So you know, we we see stuff like that. How how do you how do you deal with that and and really segregate who you want to drill down to uh, treat? Well, uh, you know, number one is is there a sense of bother? And and I would say if it's bothering him or bothering her or bothering him and her, then then that's enough bother. To, to want to intervene or at least investigate what you can do. Um, so, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of attributes of nocturia which might be dangerous, fractures, you know, hip fractures, falls in the night, this type of thing, especially in our elderly patients. Um, that, you know, that's, that risk is not small, um, but the great bulk of treatment decisions is based on the sense of bother, you know, is it really affecting him uh, or her? So um, that's my first goal is to kind of identify, you know, is this worth pursuing? Um, uh, this provided there isn't like a medical consequence of the nocturia, you know, sleep apneas and things like that, you know, which we uh -huh. actually in urology, we are uncovering with increased frequency as this becomes a little bit better known. So that's where that's kind of where I start. 
Um, you know, I, I find it helpful to look at the AUA symptom index, the International Prostate Symptom Score. I look at that score. And I mean, just visually, if everything's over on the five column, you know, all the X's as they fill it out linearly, um, as, they, as they fill that out, if everything's over on the, on the far right hand, which would be the fours and fives of all the, you know, the seven questions, then I'm thinking, well, this isn't just nocturia. There's so much, so much other LUTs going on. Um, but when those other symptoms are more modest and the nocturia question is, is really, uh, you know, really over at the extreme, that's when I'm coming down and I'm looking at the guidelines saying if the predominant complaint is nocturia, think of avoiding diaries. So, you know, just visually, when I hand these scores to patients, I ask every male to fill them out. Um, I look at that and as soon as I see that, um, I'm I'm interested in in is this this nocturia complaint is it nocturnal polyuria you know there's the various categories and I'm I'm trying to hone down on it right away I, I kind of take them out of the Lutz BPH pathway and spend some time trying to ferret this out. Well, that's a good that's a good uh, question to follow up with too and. Um... And so let's say a guy has fairly significant DPH and a component of it is uh, nocturia. How, how often does the nocturia really get better uh, significantly when you do a TUR or effectively medically treat DPH? Yeah, you know, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, we published a paper, I don't know, like two or three years ago where I had in this big data set, um, over 11,000 office visits of men, you know, 11,000 total visits. And it was like, I don't know, three or 4,000 men that I had followed over a period of time. And I, and on the day I met them, I asked them to identify their motivating complaint. Like, why'd you come see me? I had them identify that. And then every time I saw them over the ensuing years, I asked them again. And, you know, what brought you here today? And um, it, we published in the journal Urology. Uh, first author is Welliver, Charles Welliver. But anyway, he was my fellow at the time. And, and what we learned is it was 49% of the men complained that their motivating complaint was nocturia. And you know, urgency frequency was you know, second and third, but nocturia was the standout. And the chances that we improve that in some significant way as defined by the patient was less than 50% of the time. And that's surgeries, medicines, you know, we broke it all down. So basically we do a bad job on nocturia because it's the one which is most multifactorial. It's not necessarily bladder, prostate at all. It's sometimes a local presentation of a, of a global health problem. You know, it's nocturia as a manifestation of other medical diseases and as urologists we we are confronted with this and i i think we've i think we've we've ignored it long enough a couple of things you brought out that are very interesting is the economic cost of nocturia besides uh, besides all the bother and things like that um let me ask you a question how do you deal with with sort of the volume overload a lot of people drink a beer a night or alcohol or, you know, a lot of fluid, things like that. Do you really emphasize uh, reducing the amount of fluid people take in at night? You know, I, I, I didn't I didn't used to be, do a very good job of that. And um, being around, um, well, I'll, can, I'll t can I tell you an anecdote? I had a patient come in. He had bad nocturia. I did a voiding diary on him. And the guy... <laughs> The guy drank a six pack between dinner and going to bed. So I said, sir, you are so lucky. You have an Irish doctor. I'm cutting you back to two beers after dinner. <laughs> and he <laughs> came back like a month later and said, God, I don't get up at all. You're fantastic, doc. You know, I'm like, God, that was the easiest one I ever did. Um, well, so, you could also tell him to drink uh, bourbon or something else like that. Oh, it's not God. so high volume, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't smart enough to think of that day. That was a better idea. But um, uh, my message is that I, I, over time, I, I, I have incorporated this. And in fact, you know, any man with Lutz BPH, 
I'm, I, I am now talking about that. Hey, let's, let's look at fluid intake and do you, can you avoid medication entirely? Once you do avoiding diary, that really spills it out as to when he's, um, when he's drinking, when he's urinating, and then that's when you can really hone down on it. And so, yes, it can be really effective. And you don't have to improve nocturia uh, a lot in order to really improve a patient's bother and his quality of life. I mean, if you can knock him down from four to two, oh, you're, you're a star. So, um, you know, they, they really benefit from just a couple of times, you know, saving a couple of times at night. That really helps. And, and fluid management can do that. Let me ask you one, one last question, Kevin. Again, a great presentation. We've, we've had some medical therapy around for, uh, I'm not sure, for a long time, uh, various desmopressin type of uh, variations. What's, what's really new now that, that why there's this renewed interest in and why we can make a difference? Well, I mean, there is a, a, a newer medication um, on the market, uh, which is a, it, it's a desmopressin, but it's a nasal desmopressin. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, as urologists, we're just now getting, um, getting used to this, uh, you know, getting it uh, incorporated into our practices. Um, it, it is a, a faster onset. Uh, of action. So that would be an advantage. The thing with the desmopressin pills, of course, was, you know, sometimes you just wondered, God, for, was it doing anything? Um, and, and I think more uh, also important is there's a gender difference in response. And um, it still has some of the geriatric uh, warnings where you, you do have to be careful in our older men, um, but also uh, men, um, uh, women are a little bit more sensitive to the medication, so that dose has to be uh, really tailored uh, to age and and gender. Um, so uh, I think urologists are going to have to incorporate this uh, into their LUTs practice. Uh, we're going to be forced to do, I mean, we just need to do this. We're going to be seeing these, these men and in many cases women. Um, maybe primary care will take a more active role in this and we won't have as much of a load. Um, but this has kind of reinvigorated my own view, or at least brought to front and center that nocturia, it, it's time we really treat it as a, as a separate entity and not just part of aging or part of Lutz BPH. So, uh, Kevin, is there anything else that uh, we didn't cover that I should ask you? No, I think that's, uh, I think we... I think we got it uh, covered. Uh, I, I would emphasize that, um, you know, it's important. Uh, these patients, if it's not chronic polyuria, it, they're, they're not really going to respond to a TURP and, um, or to intervention. So don't make that your, your, first, your first point of attack. Um, take a step back and look for uh, systemic, uh, medical systemic problems, which may be contributing, particularly sleep disorders.